or to highlight a couple of things and um, things that aren't in there. Um, number one, um, Deacon nomination forms are in your uh, bulletin again today. Today is the deadline to turn those in. So um, please do that um, today. Um, also in your bulletin is a Baptist World Alliance envelope. We talked about that last week, and there's a little bit of information in your newsletter about that. And um, if you'd like to contribute to that offering today, our goal for that mission um, this time is $1,000. Um, Uh, time change. Next week is when the um, time changes, so don't forget to set your clocks back an hour, fall back. So that is not in your newsletter. And um, please look at the other things that are in there. There's some dates for some upcoming things. Um, welcome back to Dr. Whitworth. We're thankful um, half of our dynamic duo is back. And um, and welcome, and not really welcome, but a big thank you to Carol Lincoln for bringing the message this morning. Um, one of our own, um, very dear. So we appreciate it. And like I said, not really welcome, but thank you.
Heavenly Father, we come together, church family, friends, visitors, to worship you, to lift our voices in songs of praise, to have prayer, to listen to the message, to know that you are here with us. The joint spirits of each of us worship together. We've just sung of your amazing love. How can we ever find words enough, actions enough to thank you enough for such love, for the gift of your son who saves us? We are so grateful. Watch God and protect each of us as we leave this service later, filled with the presence and the peace of your love and your gift. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Good morning and welcome to everyone that's here today. We have some visitors with us. We welcome the Lincolns today and glad that they're here to worship with us. And at this time, if you'd look at your prayer list, there's a few names I'd just like to point out to you. There are many names on there that need prayer. And of course, all are as, all are as important as each, each one of them. But I would like to point out, of course, that David and Pat are on there. And we've already talked about that, as well as Greg. We're so glad to have Greg with us here today. We know that he's had a some struggles lately. And Doris, we're thinking about you and your upcoming surgery. So we're, we're glad that you're here today too. Um, I also want us to think about our church. We, uh, this is a testament that there are 50 people here today. We're, we're having a, an un, unusual time in our church right now with what's going on and it's just a testament to our family atmosphere about how everybody is pulling together and working together to, to get things done and I'm just so happy to see so many people here today. And now we, if we would go in and pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, you have given us so much that we could never, ever, ever even begin to repay you. But we thank you for every blessing. Now it's time for us to give you a very small portion of what you have given to us. We ask that you please use it to the best, whatever way that you choose it would be, and help it to reach someone that may not know about you. We pray these things in thy name, thy will be done. Amen.
I'm sure when you all saw the text today, you thought, why on earth would she talk about that? Well, those two little words, three tiny little syllables, are so vitally important. They are almost kind of the text of the whole Bible, and they are just uh, loaded with meaning. Let's take a look at those two words, and then I want to talk about the three times the Bible tells us that Jesus wept. One of those might be a surprise to you. Jesus, this is God's name, God the, the Son's name here on earth. I suspect that when he was in heaven, he and his father had another secret name that they spoke only to each other mentally. But when Jesus came here, you know, he was given this stuff, sinews and muscles and bones and skin and nerves nerve endings. He was also given a new human identity, Jesus, God on earth, the wept part. That is such a human thing. You know, it is for us to weep. Um, you know, we weep over happy things, we weep over sad things. Jesus wept because he was so burdened for humans. Sometimes you know, sometimes their sins, sometimes their future, and he wept at one point for himself. Uh, we know he wept at least three times and possibly some other times as well. But isn't that something to think that God wept for humans? God wept for us. The Bible reports that he wept three times. The first one is Jesus wept over Jerusalem. This text is from Luke 19, 41 through 44. And I'm using the Good News version. He came closer to the city, and when he saw it, he wept over it, saying, If you only knew today what is needed for peace, but now you cannot see it. The time will come when your enemies will surround you with blockades barricade you and close you in from every side. They will completely destroy you and the people within your walls. Not a single stone will they leave in its place because you did not recognize the time when God came to save you. Now this is actually the second time Jesus lamented over Jerusalem. Now the first time he said you know, he would gather up those people, like a mother hen, opens up her wings and gathers her chicks to her under to protect her, to protect them under her wings. The second time, Jesus is standing off from a distance, and he's thinking about all the messengers, the prophets and the messengers that he and his father have sent to Jerusalem. The people didn't care. They mistreated those messengers and often killed them in some terrible ways. By now, Jesus has looked at that, at Jerusalem, and he knows what's going to be coming. 70 AD, he knows that the Romans are gonna come in. The, the, the Jews have, res, have uh, revolted against the Romans again, and the Romans are gonna be tired of it. So Jesus knew that another 40 years, Rome was going to come in and level Jerusalem. And there was nothing he could do about it because the people didn't want it. And Jesus wept. The second time, Jesus wept as he battled with himself. Now, this one does not come from the Gospels. This comes from Hebrews 5, verses 7 and 8. In his life on earth, Jesus made his prayers and requests with loud cries and tears to God, who could save him from death, because he was humble and devoted. God heard him. But even though he was God's son, he learned through his sufferings to be obedient. In another place, we hear that Jesus was obedient unto death. So here in the Garden of Gethsemane, his two halves are battling each other. 
His physical side does not want to face what he's going to be facing. Jesus knew he was going to be facing a lot of pain and a lot of humiliation. He knew about the scourging. His back would be shredded. He knew about the pain from that crown of thorns. and He knew about those spikes crunching through his bones. I think we can understand why he did not want to face that. I don't think any of us would either. We know that he, he wept for himself. His physical body didn't want to go through that. And I don't think this was just a little misty, you know, little misty tears. I think this is truly the pores, pour, the tears pouring down his face. And we know that he sweated, he was sweating. So he sweated and his tears soaked his clothes and three times he prayed, Father, please take this away from me. Is there any other way? You know, we don't understand the ways of God sometimes. And there's nothing about God's plan of salvation that makes any sense to us humans. And Jesus was looking for a way out, but there was none. Jesus is human side lost that battle. Jesus, as the Son of God, won his battle. But you know what? We are the ones who got the prizes. We got salvation, the offer, the offer of salvation, if we want it. And we also got the, uh, the present of being able to go to God to pray anytime we want. You know, back in the Old Testament, uh, the people had to wait once a year, and the high priest would put on his you know, 25 pounds of special clothes, you know, with all the rocks on the, you know, the, the ephod and the rocks on the shoulder. And, um, he would go into the Holy of Holies once a year for the prayers of the people. We don't have to do that. We don't have to put on special clothes. We don't have to wait once a year. Some of us would be truly in a world of hurt if we had to wait once a year for prayers. That's a gift we really need to take seriously. We are the winners on that battle. The third time Jesus wept was after the death of Lazarus. It's in John 11, and the special verse there is John 11, verse 35. <clears throat> and I do want to go into a little bit of John 12. I can't do the whole, you know, the whole story, so I'll have to tell part of it, but I will read part of it. This is uh, starting John 11, verse 33. Jesus saw her weeping, and he saw how the people with her were weeping also. His heart was touched. Here's verse 35. Jesus wept. Jesus, God on earth, wept out of love for his people. They took the stone away. This is verse 41. They took the stone away. Jesus looked up and said, I thank you, Father, that you always listen to me. But I say this for the, the sake of the people here, so that they will believe that you sent me. After he had said this, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And he came out, his hands and feet wrapped in grave cloths and with the cloth around his face. Untie him, Jesus told them, and let him go. This is the greatest miracle of Jesus that we have recorded in the Bible. I'm not talking about his resurrection, but this is the greatest miracle. Now, we have record of him raising other people from death, but not after four days in the tomb. Now, when he, uh, <clears throat> when Martha saw that he was going to go to the tomb, she says, but he stinks. You know, this was a hot country, and I think you know what was happening to his body after four days. Now, she, Martha, ever, ever the practical one. Um, you know, this is... This is uh, the greatest miracle, but I have a hard time, or had a hard time understanding why Jesus would weep in the middle of this. 
when he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the tomb. I think there were a whole bunch of different reasons, and a lot of a lot of Bible commentaries have helped me out on this one. Well, his own disciples needed the sign. I think Jesus might have saw, might have thought about you know, the sins of the people and why that was going to cost him later. And Mary and Martha, those sweet, loving people, didn't quite understand. They knew. And both of them said to a person, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. They thought Jesus had to be there in person in Bethany so that he could heal their brother. But Jesus had, he had a bigger plan. So he tarried for a couple of days until Lazarus died. Mary and Martha didn't under, understand his full authority. <clears throat> as did a lot of other people. And Jesus knew that Mary and Martha had suffered great grief when their brother was sick and really suffered after he died. He was their protector. And when women were alone, you know, they were subject to a lot of, uh, a lot of abuse, a lot of neglect, and people trying to take advantage of them. Jesus knew that, so their protector is gone too. And Jesus looked around, and the people are there. A lot of them are weeping along with Mary and Martha. And Jesus saw their weeping and their sorrow, and he was so touched, and he wept. But here's the biggest one, I think. Some of the people there believed. Some of them did not. Some of those people would not trust their own eyes, and they would not trust their own ears. They refused to believe. You know, here, Jesus has performed this wonderful miracle. He has stopped the degradation you know, of Lazarus' body. And he's reversed it. He's restored him. And now he is going to be restored to health and to his sisters. <clears throat> and there were, every time Jesus was around, there were spies and there were people trying to trip him, trying to you know, trap him into saying things that they could use as an excuse to kill him. Well, they didn't need too many of those. They did it anyway. But some of those present at the time Lazarus was raised from the dead hurried the two miles to Jerusalem. They were traveling as fast as their sandaled feet could run to tell the Jewish authorities, guess what Jesus has done now? Well, Jesus restored these people. And, you know, people, some believed him and some did not. And I have to wonder, what if Jesus had not said, Lazarus? I have to wonder how many other people would have come out of the tomb as well. Now, after restoring Lazarus to health, Jesus' time wasn't yet come. So he and his men stayed in Ephraim for a, a short time until six days before Passover. And he went back to Bethany to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who's now alive. Martha, you know, and by the way, no church ever has enough Marthas. Thank you, Becky. <laughs> no church ever has enough Marthas. She was cooking, you know, serving some wonderful things that she knew Jesus and the others would enjoy. Now, these little houses in, in Jerusalem and Bethany were not very big. So if you had a party, you had it out in the open. Guess what? When you had a party, there were all the nosy people looking on. And people came probably from miles around. They'd heard about Lazarus. They wanted to see with their own eyes. So they came. Some people believed and some people didn't. Uh, now, during this dinner, Mary, and we usually see Mary at the feet of Jesus listening. Well, this time she's at his feet, but she is pouring on some very expensive perfume. She dries it with her hair, and she didn't know that she was anointing him from death, or for death, because his death was only about seven days later. I have a feeling that he went to death 
with the perfume on his still on his feet. So that may well have been a reminder that some humans loved him. Uh, I'm going to jump to John 12, 9 through 11. A large number of people heard that Jesus was in Bethany. So they went there, not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from death. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus too, because on his account, many Jews were rejecting them and believing in Jesus. This poor man's only just gotten out of the grave, and the Jewish leaders want to put him right back in there again. He now has a target on his back. As a living testimony to Jesus, uh, he was a threat to the Jewish leaders. You know, and they thought they had to protect the Jewish religion, and they certainly wanted to protect their own authority. And Lazarus was a reminder. Hmm. Now, there is a tradition that Lazarus was 30 years old when he was, you know, when he died the first time. And poor old Lazarus had to get out of town. He had to get out of Dodge, and he went to Cyprus to preserve his life. And um, he was reportedly lived there for another 30 years. And Wikipedia said in the year 890, a tomb was found in Cyprus bearing the inscription, Lazarus, a friend of Christ. Now, I've kind of galloped through some of these verses and some of these accounts. So I hope that you will, this afternoon, read John 11 and John 12. And when you get to the verse, Jesus wept, stop. Don't race over it. Stop and reflect on its deeper meaning. God weeps over his humans. And every one of those tears was a very precious gift from God. It was a gift of love. Our final hymn is uh, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. And I have to thank Alvin for what he has chosen because they're so appropriate. And we see that he rearranged things uh, so that our anthem today could be Jesus Wept. Thank you, Alvin.
Will you bow with me, please? Lord, make us a house of prayer. We want to pray first, always, and continually with thanksgiving. Bless each of us with the understanding that this is your desire for all, not just a few. Transform us into righteous men and women whose prayers are powerful and effective. Bless us as we go out into the world in your, in your name to shed your light and your love in every way that we can. In the powerful, loving name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.